Hello and welcome to Jason Graves is Burning and the top 10 most overrated things about retro video games. Now, this is not a list of 10 games. This is not a list of the most overrated retro games. If you clicked on this video and you expect me to say that like Pokemon or Zelda or something is overrated, this is not what this video is. It is not a list of games. There will be no games on this list. Also, overrated by the nature of the word. The meaning of the word means that something is held in too high a regard by the population at large. Obviously, different people have different opinions, and there's no one-size-fits-all consensus for anything. Overrated only in the sense from where I see it, obviously. The point is, these are unpopular opinions and you're not supposed to agree. If you find yourself agreeing with me on all these picks, then it means that I have not done my job. You are meant to disagree. This is a video with a list of 10 things that you will disagree with me on. You are going to like some of these things, and you are not going to like that I'm saying that they're overrated. Starting with number 10, the Sega Dreamcast. Yo, Sonic! Sonic! Man, stay off the light speed! My bad. Because we've overcorrected, I think. The thing with the Dreamcast is that nobody says anything negative about it anymore. And if you look up a list of the most underrated things, like the most underrated game consoles of all time, there's a pretty good chance that the Dreamcast is going to be the number one game system on the list, right? People fucking love the Dreamcast. And I even kind of like the Dreamcast. I, I do like the Dreamcast. It's not even kind of. I like the Dreamcast, but it's hella overrated. I think as a console, the library really top to down, I don't even think it's much more impressive than the Saturns. Of course, you obviously have to include the Japanese library in that, or it's a ludicrous statement just counting the American games. Obviously, the Dreamcast did a better library if you just count North American games. But it's just like it's a bunch of fighting games. I guess if you like fighting games, if you like shooters, there's some good shooters on the Dreamcast. But like, it's, it's way too arcadey focused for me. I'm not a huge fan of just like, 90s arcade style games a lot of people say it's tragic that the dreamcast wasn't allowed to live out its full life because it was on pace to becoming one of the greatest game systems of all time and hence like that's why it's great but like i don't know in an alternate reality where all of the early xbox or like ps2 or like the multi-platform games that sega developed right after the dreamcast died if those were on the dreamcast would the Dreamcast be a better system? Yes. Would those games be better games? No. Those games are all better off on the Xbox, or like in Sonic Adventure 2's case on the GameCube, or just the other scattered releases that they had. They're better on the other systems. They wouldn't have been better off on the Dreamcast. And this thing doesn't get enough credit for killing Sega and making them merge with a fucking pachinko company. Yeah, that happened. If, if you didn't know, Sega merged with Sammy, which is a pachinko company, a couple years after the Dreamcast. And you know, I looked it up. I looked up Sega's financial history in terms of uh, their annual gains and losses, their net profit or whatever. And in the entire history that I could find, it went back to the Sega Genesis days, there were six years, six years, where Sega posted an annual loss. You want to know what five of those years were? 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. 1998 being the year that the Dreamcast came out in Japan. 2001, 2001 being the year that it was discontinued. And then the year after. The other year was 2015, if you're curious. So, it was a financial disaster for Sega. Because they sold the thing so damn cheap. They sold it at a loss, probably. I don't know if they did, but they at least weren't making that much money on this thing. I think they were selling it for like 100 or 150 bucks in like 2000, just to get this thing into the market. And it worked. It did penetrate the market in its like good year and a half that it had. But whoops, there's no copy protection. So you can just fucking pirate all the games. So like it was a fucking, it was a financial disaster for Sega. It doesn't get enough of the blame for killing them off as a console manufacturer. Oh, and here's a really unpopular theory that I never get anybody to go along with me on, but I am of the opinion that the Sega Dreamcast gets lumped in with the wrong generation of consoles. 
Like, people consider it a part of, I think, the sixth generation with the PS2 and the GameCube and the Xbox. Not true. I don't think that's true. In fact, here's my case. Right here, I've made a timeline of when the Sega Dreamcast was on the market and what it was competing with. There was never a time where Sega was supporting the Dreamcast that you could go to a store and buy a Dreamcast alongside a GameCube and an Xbox. They were never their company's current system at the same time. It never happened. Because the Xbox and the GameCube came out after the Dreamcast was discontinued. When this thing was on the market, by and large, it shared its space with the N64 and the PlayStation. I am of the opinion that Sega produced two fifth-generation game consoles. And that is ultimately why the Dreamcast failed. They released their console midway through the life cycle. And it died with the old generation of consoles. It died with the N64. It died with the PS1. It died when it was supposed to, based on the specs of the system. They were just, they were incredibly foolish with this thing. Also, I think it's worth noting that no matter what generation you put it in, the fifth or the sixth, it's notably worse than all the competition. Out of this entire pack of consoles, the N64, the GameCube, the Xbox, the PS1 and 2, the Dreamcast is the worst one by far. Now, it's only number 10 because I still like the Dreamcast. After all, it's the console of the Blue Stinger Illbleed duology. It's the console of Jet Grind Radio. It's the console of the first two Sonic Adventure games. There's some good stuff on the Dreamcast. It's just way overrated. Oh yeah, and this controller sucks. Let me go. I think Ojimbo got hold of a bad taco. Okay, and the number nine most overrated thing in retro gaming, upscalers. This thing right here is like the basic bitch entry level upscaler. If you want to get the good brand, this is a retro tank. They're considered like the best brand in upscalers that you can buy new now. This thing was over $100, and it's the cheapest one they got. They sell one of these motherfucking things for $750. And I can't even blame RetroTink. I can't even blame the company for charging that much. Because you motherfuckers are paying for it. It's your fault. Yes, you, watching the video, it's your fault that these fucking things are so goddamn expensive because people are paying for them. They sell out instantly they can't keep the fucking things in stock and there's 750 bucks it's a fucking upscaler you okay what this is how it works plug in the game system to this end and it outputs hdmi on this end it's all it does and most of the time you don't even need it you don't even need one of these fucking things like if you are not making youtube videos if you're not capturing footage with old game consoles most of the time, it's just fine plugging it into the TV. It's normally just fine. If you have a Super Nintendo, plug it into your TV if it has a composite input. Just do it. It looks fine. It looks fucking fine. It looks fine with fucking RF. RF's like the cable jack. You'd screw in the, the cable to the back. All TVs still have that. Just fucking do that. It looks fine. I mean, I mean, it looks closer to what the fuck you remember. I hear about people buying the fucking $750 retro tank. And they want to plug their fucking PlayStation 5 and Series X's into the damn thing. Why? What? Fucking, like, no joke. I've heard people say they want to do that. Like, oh, I want to get it to put my Switch into the into the upscale. Like, fucking, what? I, I don't know why. There are, like, some flimsy options in these things. They're just... You would have to be a fucking psycho to want to use, like, 90% of them. This thing can put fake scan lines on the footage, actually. You would have to be a fucking freak to even can think that that's a good idea. To even, like, consider the option of putting fake scan lines in your footage. Like, I, I can't even get into that headspace. It looks so bad. It looks so bad. And, like, <laughs> the differences between these things. It's like barely there. Here's some footage I grabbed online of the $750 one of these fucking things. Does it look that much worse? Like really, does this look that much worse? And people get way too far into finding the optimal way to play my old games on my new TV. Just like, the, it's way, it's way too fucking overboard, man. I, like I can't stand that shit. Just play the damn games. 
people get so wrapped up into the minutia of like how they're gonna play their games that they don't actually play the games you spend a million years setting the damn thing up and then you don't play anything i mean i understand that not every tv these days has composite inputs in fact most new flat screens don't but if you have like a slightly older one you probably got a composite you definitely have a component input right so like just plug your shit into the tv if you're not worried about capturing footage zach there goes the civilized world Okay, and the number eight most overrated thing about retro gaming. This one, probably a popular opinion with most people, but some people won't let it go. Is anything older than the NES? Any home console, I should say, older than the NES. I believe that arcade games from before that time still hold plenty of merit. There are fucking YouTube boomers out there that treat the Atari 2600 like it was some fucking, like it still is. I mean, I guess it was in the 70s. In the 70s and early 80s, sure. Atari 2600, Atari VCS was the shit. Don't fucking look me in the eye, <coughs> John Hancock, <coughs> and say that you sit down now and you fucking enjoy playing Atari games for more than, like, 30 seconds at a time. They're not enjoyable on, like, any kind of real level. You don't get home from a long, hard day at work and fucking settle in to the futon and be like, oh, let's play a game. And you fucking play the Atari. It doesn't happen. Nobody does that. I can understand maybe collecting the games because Atari 2600 box art's pretty badass. The art, mwah, good. I like that. But, like, the games themselves, man. Here, here is the one scenario in which playing old Atari games is fun. If you get a huge stack of them, and, you, and you're and you with a friend, you can't be alone, this only works with a friend. You get a huge stack of Atari games, and you just one by one, you just fucking plow through a shitload of them. And you just like make fun of them. It's like watching a bad movie with somebody. That's the enjoyment you get out of Atari games. You don't have real fun with like any of them. You sit down, and you fucking plow through one every 30 seconds. Don't fucking tell me. Like, don't leave a fucking comment being like, Oh, I love the Atari. Like, motherfucker, no. You're not sitting down. You're not getting a fucking long gaming session in of goddamn Keystone Capers. You're not doing it. You're not You're not playing Kaboom round after round after round after, after round. You're not doing it. You're not playing Pitfall for fucking 20 goddamn hours. Like, it's not happening. You're not going to go through every screen in Pitfall. You're going to play until you lose your three lives, and then that's it. You're going to move on to the next game. Because that's what Atari games are good for. Now, I actually think that the Intellivision library is more interesting than the Ataris. Also notice how the three Atari games I used as examples were all Activision games. Because Atari themselves kind of made shitty games for their own system. It was really the Activision machine. That's where the interest is in old Atari games. In old Activision games. Now, I used to have an Atari and an Intellivision and a Coleco, but I sold all, well, no, I sold two of them. I still have my Intellivision. I didn't feel like digging it out of storage for this video. Pretend I'm holding my Intellivision right now. One day, I just had a realization that I don't like these games. I don't enjoy playing these games. I had a whole fucking bin. I probably had 200 Atari 2600 games because they were so goddamn cheap. When I was a teenager, I would just buy them continuously because they were so cheap. And there's a reason they were cheap. There's a reason that Atari games, unlike every other game system, didn't explode in value and everything else did. Because they fucking suck! And nobody wants to play them! Nobody honestly wants to play them! You've got mega nerds that pretend to like them because they liked them when they were a kid. And that's it. There's a reason that you can go online that you can find 13-year-old kids now that are into retro games, that are into NES games. Yes, it's true. I've seen it with my own two eyes here on YouTube. I've seen this happen. They're never into Atari! Nobody gives a fuck! The game sucked. And I find Intellivision more sophisticated and lifelike. If you try them both, I think you'll find the clear winner is Intellivision. Okay, and for number seven, we're going back to the Church of Sega. Because the number seven most overrated thing in retro gaming isn't a thing at all, it's a person, and it's Tom Kalinske. If you don't know, Tom Kalinske was the president of Sega of America from sometime in 1990 until I think June of 1996, 
which was a little over a year after the Saturn launch. He gets a lot of credit, rightfully so might I add, for successfully marketing the Genesis in America. It was his idea to put Sonic in as the pack-in game. All those aggressive ads, those iconic Sega Genesis advertisements, Genesis does, that was all, that all came under his leadership. And he rightfully gets a lot of credit for helping Sega succeed over that time. But, but, he doesn't get nearly, nearly enough of the blame for the shitstorm that eventually led to Sega being merged with a pachinko company. Because he was a major domino in all that. Like, make no fucking mistake about it. And I think the most damning part, the most damning bit of evidence to this was that leaked financial document. You remember that from a while back. I think it was less than a year it happened ago. The company's a fucking mess! It's from 1996. And why is it that in 1996, we're only a year removed from supposedly this huge success with the Sega Genesis, right? Why is the company already fucked? Why? What happened? So, it's a fucking disaster in that report, right? They have hundreds of thousands of unsold 32Xs. Hundreds of thousands of copies of multiple Sega Genesis games, including good selling ones like Sonic and Knuckles. They're just sitting on hundreds of thousands of copies that are not being ordered by stores. They're not being bought. They were eventually liquidated, I think, by uh, Majesco a few years later, probably for pennies on the dollar. This was a huge financial shitstorm. He, he over-ordered basically fucking everything that they produced back then. Okay, so I looked up the exact numbers from the financial report. This is hardware sales. They have an excess of 391,000 Game Gears, 401,000 unsold 32X systems, 623,000 unsold 32X games, 110 unsold Sega CDs. The Sega CD was long dead by this point. 855,000 unsold Genesis systems, 113,000 unsold copies of NFL 95, another 94,000 unsold copies of NFL Primetime Football, 83,000 for College Football's National Championship, 42,000 unsold Light Crusaders, 92,000 unsold Sonic the Hedgehogs, 215,000 unsold Sonic and Knuckles, None of these are being ordered. 123,000 unsold Vector Mans. 83,000 unsold Power Rangers, I'm assuming the movie, the game. 85,000 unsold Garfield. 32,000 Echo Jr. The list just goes fucking on. They have a total of 1.4 million unsold Genesis cartridges just sitting in a warehouse, not being ordered. How do you fuck up that bad? That's what the 1996 financial report shows. They had unsold stock of fucking everything that they made to the total of hundreds of thousands of each thing. It's a fucking mess. He's also the guy. He doesn't get enough shit for being the 32X guy. The 32X was a fucking Hindenburg disaster for Sega. It doesn't get stated enough. It, it's kind of just seen as like a shitty thing, like a shitty experiment that they tried and it didn't go anywhere. I mean, it's rightfully seen as a bad console because it was, but the full effect of like how big of a fucking disaster the 32X was, I don't think gets stated enough. So in 1994, they're talking about bringing out the Saturn, right? The Saturn is coming up and they're discussing plans to roll out the Saturn worldwide, right? This is the next generation of Sega. I don't know if this was personally Tom Kalinske's idea, but it, Sega of America was the company under his leadership that didn't want to move on from the Sega Genesis. They didn't want to move on to the next thing. They didn't want to move on to the Saturn. So they proposed basically a stopgap. They're like, okay, how about you roll out the Saturn to the rest of the world, but we here at Sega of America, because remember, Sega of America is not like Nintendo of America. Nintendo of America just translates and markets games. Sega of America had its own robust game-making arm. They made games themselves at Sega of America, and lots of them. Basically, they were like, okay, you guys do your own thing with the Saturn. We're going to put out this thing called the 32X because we can't move on from the Genesis because it was too successful here. 
and we're going to focus our resources on making games for this thing. And we all know how that went. They obviously should have just put their resources into the Saturn. They should have just made games from the Saturn. They should have just been all in on the Saturn. But no, they didn't do that. They dragged their feet with the 32X. It was a fucking disaster. Which led... Which led to Tom Kalinske. He's the guy. He's the guy on stage in that infamous E3 press conference saying that the Saturn is going to launch early. The surprise launch that pissed off retailers. He's the guy up there promising that the Saturn is going to have 20 games ready within a month. It took him over half a year to get to 20 games. Not one month. So let's recap. Tom Kalinske, the guy responsible for making the Genesis a success, sure, gets credit for that, doesn't get nearly enough blame for the failure of the 32X and the failure of the American Saturn launch, and really just the whole thing, because the bad launch sunk the whole thing from the beginning. The Saturn never gained traction here, which led to them fast-tracking the Dreamcast, which led to Sega releasing two fifth-generation consoles, which led to the Dreamcast dying when it did because it technologically couldn't hold up to the other ones. Really, he, like, he caused the downfall of Sega, and nobody fucking puts the blame at his feet. It's always, like, how great Tom Kalinske is. The great and genius Tom Kalinske. Until Sega of Japan, the dastardly Sega of Japan, came over and fucked everything up. When it's like, no. 32X wasn't Sega of Japan. Fucking up the American launch of the Saturn wasn't Sega of Japan. Have you, you ever watched Pandemonium? Go watch Pandemonium. There are horror stories. He interviews developers, by the way, of people who made Saturn games. The stories they tell about developing for the Saturn in its early years. Like, they're fuck, they're insane. They're fucking insane. They're telling stories about how they had to fucking share computers. Because there was only one that could actually work on Saturn games. So, they would have to, like, work in shifts. Imagine a game development team that has to work in fucking shifts to get their work done. Because they only have one goddamn computer that's capable of making fucking Saturn games. Like, somebody would come in in the morning, shift, do their work. And then another guy would come in in the afternoon, shift, and do their work. And then somebody would have to fucking work overnight. Work on the damn game! On the same fucking team! Because they couldn't get enough fucking development kits out to the goddamn developers. The surprise launch, they fucking sprung on, like, all, like, the, the developers only knew, like, a month ahead of time. Fucking Tom Kalinske calls up all these developers that were, thought that they were working on launch Saturn games. And they're like, hey, we're moving the launch back six months. And most of them were just fucking dumbfounded. Like, what? We can't have the game ready in a month. He had, like, no idea how game development worked. He had no eye for games at all. He was purely a business guy. Yeah, man, fucking Tom Kalinske, man. I don't get the fucking blowjobs for Tom Kalinske. We started our rollout of Sega Saturn yesterday. We were at retail today. I mean, this whole thing leads me into number six. The number six most overrated thing in retro gaming is the Sega versus Nintendo console war. Okay, I get it. I get you were a kid, and it's like half fake. Like, calling it a war is already, like, an exaggeration. It wasn't a war. Brands fight all the time. There's Coke and Pepsi. There's fucking Monster and Rockstar and Red Bull. Sony versus Microsoft has been going on way longer. It has had a much bigger impact than the gaming industry at large. Sega versus Nintendo was really only a thing in America, first off, because in Japan, the Genesis really shit the bed. And it was really only a thing for a few years. Like, 91 to 95. The, that was the extent of the, the Sega versus Nintendo console war. And then, like, they both got blown out of the fucking water by the PlayStation anyway. Like, a year later. And it's like, 96 is like, alright, PlayStation's here and it wins. It just wins. That was it. Console wars don't matter. You, you guys all lose. So, <laughs> I get that when you were a kid, like, you couldn't have had both. So, like, you had to pick one. But, like, that's true of every console generation. When I was in middle school, you either had a 360 or you had a PS3. Or you were like me and you had a Wii. But, like, it meant that you couldn't play online with your friends, is what it meant. Like, if they had the other console. And, like, it was, it was important then. But, like, fucking... In the 90s, it mattered even, like, less because there wasn't, like, online play. 
It meant that she couldn't, like, share games with that friend. But you could like, go over to their house and, like, experience it anyway. Like, everybody from the fucking 90s. It's not like you didn't play the other system. It's not like you didn't look at the other system and fucking want a game on that thing. Nobody was so loyal that they just fucking ignored the other side. Like, sure, you had a preference, but, like, shit, man. <laughs> this gets circle jerked so hard. I mean, people who grew up in this era remember the whole thing fondly, but I think they just really overstate what it meant <laughs> just in general. And if you really, like, take a step back and, like, look at it, the whole extent of the warring was really just the snarky Sega Genesis ad. Did Nintendo even, like, really clap back or acknowledge Sega's existence? Like, you've got the fucking ad with, like, the car comparing Sonic to, like, Mario Kart going really slow. But, like, that's, that's all it really fucking was from, like, a business end. I don't know. I mean, I might just be too young to understand this properly. But the console wars are just way overstated. So what's blast processing do? And, uh, what if you don't have blast processing? And the number five most overrated thing in retro gaming is any console variant that only makes a marginal difference. I'm talking heavy six Switch Atari 2600s. I'm talking one chip Super Nintendos. I'm talking Sega Genesis models that say high definition graphics on them. I'm talking PlayStation 1s with that specific serial number on the back. I don't remember which one it is. I'm talking shit that like barely matters at all. But if you go on Reddit or something, if you go on like r slash SNES, you would think that having a one-chip Super Nintendo was the fucking end-all be-all. Like, it's the end of the goddamn world if you bought a Super Nintendo and it's not a fucking one-chip. If you don't know what this is, the Super Nintendo had two variants. The, the video output was either handled by one chip or two chips, depending on when your system is from. I believe two chips are the older models and one chip was the newer. I'm not sure what the junior, the smaller Super Nintendo used. I don't know if that's comparable to the one or two. Well, anyway, if you're buying a Super Nintendo, you're supposed to open it up and see if you have one or two chips handling your video output. Because if you got the special one chip, it means that your video output is somehow better. But, like, here's some footage I found online of F-Zero. And here is F-Zero running on my Super Nintendo, which is a two chip. Does it look any fucking different? Like, at all? Maybe, like, if you squint, but I could easily chalk that up to just using a different upscaler or converter or something. Like, just buy your damn game systems. Don't worry about if your Sega Genesis says high-definition graphics on. You want to know what the fucking the difference is between the, the high-definition graphics Sega and the one that doesn't say it? I, the sound chip is slightly different in a way that I would never be able to hear the fucking difference in a million years. And I think there's like one or two games that don't work on the model that doesn't say it. Not notable games. They're like fucking EA Sports games that like nobody gives a shit about. So today, actually, I was at a game store called Stomping Grounds Game Center in Gainesville, Florida. They're a cool store. This isn't meant to put them on blast. But they were selling both models of the Genesis 1. And there was a $40 price difference between the two. Really? Are the high definition models really going for that much more? A 50% almost increase? That's stupid. Now don't get this confused with console variants that do make a difference. I think to a lesser extent the Game Boy Advance SP with the better screen counts, but the screen is significantly better, so I guess that makes more of a difference. But like something like the backwards compatible PS3s, no, that that's a variant worth having. Like that's fucking awesome. I'm not talking about that. I mean ones that you would really have to like hold a fucking magnifying glass up to your system to even notice a difference. People act like such fucking elitists about this online. Just play the damn games and what you have. You're fine. If you have a two-chip Super Nintendo, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to buy another Super Nintendo. You're fine. The pursuit of perfection in the retro gaming community just makes me sick. It's the whole upscaling thing all over again. Because it's like people are obsessed with having the absolute best setup and they don't even really focus on playing the games it's all about the setup they have more fun putting the setup together than they do playing the games and man 
I just think that's wrong, because I think retro gaming should be about the damn games, not about the fucking upscalers and about the one-chip Super Nintendo. Good news is that you can get sharper RGB video out of a Super Nintendo. The bad news is that you might have to buy another Super Nintendo. The number four most overrated thing in retro gaming. This is more about YouTubers, I think, than the general populace, because I don't think regular people say this. But saying that you're doing it for preservation. Motherfucker, no you're not. Remember about a year ago, this headline was going around about how 87% of retro video games are not properly preserved? Here's this article by the Video Game History Foundation, written by Kelsey Lewin. Kelsey Lewin's awesome. I love Kelsey Lewin. See my retro game YouTuber tier list. But this thing is so full of shit. It is complete fucking hogwash, hearsay, alarmist nonsense, and could not be any less true. 87% of classic video games released in the United States are critically endangered? I'll, I'll save you the time. This whole fucking article, basically all it means is that 87% of all games ever, you cannot buy on modern consoles. That's all it means. Which is the dumbest shit I have ever heard. As if it is up to the game companies that they need to sell everything that they've ever made at all times. Yes, ideally, it would be awesome if I could boot up the Xbox and feasibly purchase and play every game ever released for any Xbox platform. That would be awesome. But it's also not how the world works. Do we say that films are not properly preserved if they're not currently available on any modern streaming platform? Do we say that a book is not preserved if you can't buy it on Amazon? No, because that's fucking stupid. The truth is that most games are preserved as ROM files on the internet at the very least. You can download almost anything. You can find it. Almost any game that exists for any major game console, you can go on the internet and you can download it. It's out there. It's been preserved. Buying Earthbound for the Super Nintendo is not preserving video games. Fucking paying $200 for God Hand is not preserving video games. No, collecting games is not preserving games. I'm sorry, it's not. If you're somebody like Hard for Games and you track down pre-release things and you dump ROMs, then you're preserving video games. If you're scanning manuals and uploading them online, that's preserving video games. Not fucking collecting them. Game collecting is not preservation. They're not the same thing. I'm sorry. This is a short one. I mean, it really just grinds my gears when YouTubers say, Oh, it's about the preservation. And it's like, no, a, a very small amount of what you're doing is actual game preservation. It's like everything has been dumped. Especially for like Nintendo consoles. You're not going to buy a game that doesn't have a ROM of it online. Maybe in the 90s this would have been true, but like nowadays, no, everything exists already online. You are not preserving video games by collecting them. I'm just repeating myself now, that's all I really have to say about that. You really get into the, 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 the big differences between preserve, uh, preserving and just playing. The number three most overrated thing in retro gaming is playing games on original hardware. Hate to say it, because I like playing games on original hardware, but, like, surrounding ourselves with, like, totems. These fucking worthless pieces of crap. Because my entire Super Nintendo collection, just like, fucking, just like all this, just like these fucking games. Like, you put, God, like, they're all fucking, practically, they're fucking worthless. Fucking, they, there's no reason to have any of these. No reason. No reason to ever buy any fucking game. I don't even know if you can hear me. You probably can't. You probably can't even hear me. You, just like all this, you could fucking put on this. You can just put it on this. Put it in one of these. And it's functionally the exact same. But even that, like even that is still using original hardware. What you could do is you could just download the entire Super Nintendo library in less than fucking 10 seconds probably because it's small. And then you can just boot up SNES 9X and play the games. And they're functionally the fucking same. <laughs> There's no goddamn difference at all. <laughs> so, there's really no practical reason to just play games on old, old hardware. It's irrational. Like, because the, 
the quote-unquote best way to play them is emulation. It looks cleaner. You don't have to fucking mess with upscalers. It's way less expensive because it's free. And hey, if it's free, it's for me. I mean, I enjoy playing games on old hardware, but it's just because I'm a fucking hipster loser. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's somehow better because it's not. I mean, you get, like, save states on fucking... You can, like, transfer your saves. You can, like, you can do so many things with an emulator that you can't do on real hardware. It's just better. It's better all around. Recently, there's been a controversy with Pat the NES Punk and his N64 book. Because all of the writers didn't own an N64, and some of them emulated the games. <gasps> emulated the games! To review them. Bitch, it's not 2002 anymore. N64 emulation works fine. It works fine! I know you don't like to hear it. I know you want to cling to the original hardware mythos that this is the only true way to play the games. But it's really not. Emulation works fucking good for anything... Anything older than, like, even shit, even into the fucking 6th gen, like the PS2, Xbox, GameCube. Like, Dolphin's like a perfect GameCube emulator. Just, they fuck, they just work. You don't need a GameCube, because you can just play them on Dolphin. And it works perfectly. And it's better than playing on an actual GameCube. It's just, it's silly. I mean, you can fit an entire impressive game room. Like, look at Gamer Aimer's game room. You can fit... 90% of that on a fucking SD card. I think it's cool that things like this exist, but it's not rational. It's not logical. It's not better, even, playing games on old hardware. Therefore, it's overrated. Which leads me to number two. <laughs> the number two most overrated thing <laughs> in retro gaming is emulation. <laughs> yes, somehow even more overrated than playing games on real hardware is emulating them. <laughs> Somehow more overrated. Just don't play games at all. Playing games is overrated. The most overrated thing about gaming is, is playing the games. Games suck. They're a waste of time. They're a waste of life. Go outside. Do something productive with your time. The time you spend fucking playing Final Fantasy 3, you could learn to play the goddamn guitar in the amount of time it takes you to fucking beat Final Fantasy 3. Go do that. Go learn a skill. Go make a movie. Go learn how to fucking program. <laughs> Don't waste your fucking life with this shit. Don't waste your life playing Vegas Stakes on Super Nintendo. Go to a real casino. Make a fucking Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas parody in front of your green screen. <laughs> do anything. Don't play games. They're a fucking waste of time. Don't do it. No, I had a point with this. Where was I going? No, because the emulation thing, it's the same, it's the fucking upscaler problem. It's the fucking one-chip Super Nintendo mindset. It's the search of the perfect game setup. It's not so much emulation, it's more the fucking people that set up a retro pie, a Raspberry Pi with, like, emulators, and then they never shut the fuck up about it. Like, having access to all of these games at the same time is not the same as just hunkering down with one game and really committing to it. Because you get choice overload. It's not only is it choice paralysis when you're trying to pick a game, it's that you never stick with a game long enough to actually learn it and get any enjoyment out of it. If you have a list of ROMs and you can easily just switch between any of them at the snap of a finger, it normally results in you not committing to any one of those games. So, there are so many people that will just, like, fucking not give old games the time and attention they deserve because they just play them for two minutes and then they move on to the next thing. And emulation facilitates that. It, fits, it facilitates this mindset that they're just interchangeable pieces of data that don't matter. See the rant <laughs> for number three. Oh man, and you know who's the fucking worst? Like, it seems like that there's, this is like, no matter what group of people you're in, there's always one guy like this. They're the fucking person that likes Nintendo, or likes Nintendo, or likes to talk about Nintendo, but they don't own a Switch, and they won't shut the fuck up about Simu. Like, when Tears of the Kingdom came out, how many people came out of the woodworks and were like, Oh, I got it working. Oh, I got it working on Simu. And it's running at 120 frames a second at 8K. Mm, and look at me. 
Uh, I have Simu on my computer and I emulate Twitch games and I download them a week before they come out. Uh, fucking, I hate those people. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then look in the mirror because you are those people. Fucking god damn it. I just hate everybody. I hate games. I hate emulators. I hate real games. Everything's overrated. Just the whole world. The whole world is overrated. Living is overrated. You're overrated. I'm overrated. Everything is fucking overrated. But the most overrated thing in all of retro gaming is saying that everything needs to make a comeback. Is clamoring for constant sequels. It's calling for revivals of every retro property that has ever existed. Saying that this needs a fucking modern remake. Why? Why does everything need to come back? Can't we just let things die in the past? Can't we just let things exist as they once were? Why do we need to dig up the grave of every forgotten video game series? Or not so forgotten video game series and just fucking take a big dump on it? Why? Why do we need to do that? So, Chrono Trigger is an example, right? I habitually make people play through Chrono Trigger so I can relive playing it for the first time vicariously through other people. This is something that I have done probably a dozen times in my life. Made somebody play Chrono Trigger. And always the topic comes up. Hey, uh, wouldn't it be cool if they remade it with modern graphics? Or, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if they made another Chrono sequel? And I'm always like, no. Obviously, if this gets made, I would buy it day one. I would fucking dig into that full fucking force. And that's the goddamn problem with all this shit, is that sequels do better, is that revivals, is that remasters, is that old ideas are more appealing than new ideas. Because the new ideas are fucking scary. And I'm as guilty as this as anybody. The only modern games I play have connections to old things from the past. I don't play new IPs hardly at fucking all. And it sucks, because I really should, because that's where the good shit is. Fucking, like, the Mario RPG remake? I mean, people were excited about it, I guess. And I'm just like, why? Why do we need this? You've got fucking full-grown men on YouTube crying about them remastering Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. Fucking crying over a game you can already fucking play. You've got Arlo looking off into the sunset. Oh, finally, the Thousand Year Door, it's coming. Motherfucker, I got, like, it's right here. The game's right here. You can play it right now. Like, fucking, why does everything need to come back? Why do we need to ruin everything? Why do we need a shitty 3D Chrono remake? Look what they did to Secret of Mana. It looks like a fucking DS game from 2006, not a PlayStation 4 game from, like, 2019 or whatever that shit came out. It looks awful. I didn't play it. They brought back Actraiser. That looks like shit. Fucking, why, why does everything need to come back? Tell me. It's just the constant clamoring. Like, do we need a fucking Donkey Kong Country 3 remake? No. Do we need a new Mario Paint? Okay, maybe actually that would be pretty cool. Do we need a new fucking... Do we need a Super Metroid HD? Perfect example. Perfect fucking example. This is a perfect game. We don't need a goddamn new fucking Super Metroid. We don't need it. We don't need it. Just play Super Metroid, man. We don't need HD Super Metroid. Mmm. I mean, some things, I guess, are no-brainers. Like, making Sonic widescreen. Yes, please, Sega. Have my money. Good idea. Thank you. The Final Fantasy Pixel remasters. I guess if you're going to rebuild old RPGs from the ground up with new sprites and options to make the games easier, it's fine. It's good. It's good. But it's just like, fucking, let things have dignity. Let good things exist always as good things. It's not always the right move to bring everything back. Some things are fine the way they are. And I really, it just gets under my skin. The constant need to want a sequel, to want a remake, to want a remaster. Anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> shout out to the patrons. Shout out to William Robert Lee. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.
<laughs> He's gonna... Yep. <laughs> this was a good day. <laughs> this 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 was a really good day. <laughs> I'm happy. I feel <laughs> at peace. <laughs> I feel I, I feel oh. peaceful <laughs> oh on the inside. God. Like like everything's gonna turn out alright.